Hi everyone. If you've watched some of our previous Young to Live By videos before, then you'll know that the genome on timed release across the lifespan expresses instincts, which energise and direct a person towards adaptation to the outside world. Sometimes, through learning, memory or suggestion, these instincts can become misdirected away from facilitating the intended teleology of the person and form a biopsychosocial structure manifest as a system known as a complex. Complexes, as an update to the original Jungian concept through clinical empiricism and insights from the biosciences, make up much of the therapeutic work within Steve and Pauline's psychosystems analysis model of depth psychology. The descriptor of complex covers a wide bandwidth of presenting phenomena. They can vary significantly in clinical presentation and relative position to the ego. Within psychosystems analysis, they are usually characterized via taxonomy as either identified, that is within the self-concept, aligned, that is in an active relationship to consciousness, or non-aligned, that is completely unconscious relative to the ego. This relative position can describe either the whole of a complex or parts of them, which makes working with them in mind during therapeutic work an engaging task that requires, above all, relational skill in the therapist. In this video, taken from a high-level second-year IPSA professional training seminar, one of our students asked Steve what the best way to deal with non-aligned complexes is. Considering their relative distance from the ego, perhaps it would be best to first bring it into identification first, was the question asked. Steve's response covers a lot of ground, including an overview of the taxonomy of complexes, how they operate in relation to the ego, meaning what the qualitative dynamic of relating from the complex to the ego appears to be from observation, and why hypnosis is the best means to deal with them once and for all. We really hope that you enjoy. With the non-aligned uh, complexes, we have to first infer that they even exist because there's no conscious relationship, even a transitory one, to the ego with that. It, it's something which is so autonomous, but so not there. There's no obvious way that it presents. So we kind of infer that it exists when we investigate the other kinds of complex. And then something might emerge in the background. And what you would then get would be a kind of a, a, a ramified tree. And on the surface, there would, there would be the ones that we distilled with working with someone collaboratively into finding that these are identified with issues. And then we see those more dynamic ones that move around a lot, that, that slip into being not aligned, in other words, beneath the waves. And then it appears again with its periscope, looks around, or it might completely surface. And then we find the one that we've uncovered that might be running both of them. Uh, and so it's, it's usually an emergent property. It is so unconscious. Mark Solms would say automatized, uh, an automatized system of learning that it's so, so distanced away from access. We don't even know it's there. It may or may not be significant. It may simply be flattened into long-term memory and have no uh, direct effect on consciousness unless something else triggers it. And what might trigger it could be instincts. It, it could be a, an attempt at recall consciously, which then triggers it by attention and attaches emotion and libido to it. And this thing comes out. There's a number of different ways it, that that could happen. So it's inferential that there is something there. And when we do a, a kind of a forensic analysis on the dynamics of con uh, complexes, it may simply be that actually there's an element of an aligned one or even an identified one which has been hidden which is not 
something that's flattened, uh, but, but was there all along and we hadn't yet detected it. So it's a hypothesis that these things must exist because of the size and the bandwidth of memory and learning, that there are things in there and that we, we were not directly experiencing them. Another, uh, another way that they can emerge, as I say, is simply because of instinctive pressure on its way up. It may perturb past memories and suddenly something emerges that had been relatively dormant. Uh, and then, of course, having been disturbed and coming into the field of consciousness, it will emerge into being an aligned complex at minimum, uh, perhaps even identified with if the ego is susceptible to that memory and it's flattened, previously flattened out associations. So they can appear from nowhere. So we have to then infer it was always there. At least, you know, if, if it's if it's memories from the past, it's always been there. However, if it's something which has been constructed, which also happens, in other words, a false memory, then that's not something to do with the past. That's something to do with the present. So the culprit for that will be the dynamics operating as an aligned complex or as an identified complex or both examples working together for common purpose with respect to the ego. Because false associations and memories can emerge. So that's not actual memory. It's not actual learning. That's a construction that occurs under dynamic pressure. Practical empiricism is the most important thing. What you meet in people must be reflected in the model that we use rather than imposing a model, that never works. We always distort our experiences and the experiences of others by doing that. But this actually matches what you will experience. So when something appears to be created as a new memory, then something dynamic is, is creating that. If, however, it is a genuinely recovered memory, which having been recovered, either spontaneously because of internal pressure or because the, the, the ego is looking for it, if it's a genuine memory, well, that's fine. We, we can say that that is something that was in memory, uh, non-accessible, therefore a potential non-aligned complex, which is now active and moved into the aligned state. If the ego experiences that and says, oh my God, then it might suddenly become identified with. So it's gone from non-aligned to aligned. Sorry, to identified with. It's, it's actually skipped the middle phase. It's gone directly in. That happens a lot where the ego is vulnerable to also suggestion of some kind on the basis of past conditioning and learning, which may have been flattened out as Mark Solms talks about it and just gone into autonomized long-term memory. But now it's been reconstituted. It becomes active and it's a bit of a shock and people will feel that. So, oh, well, where did that come from? Well, it was always there, but apparently it wasn't bothering you, you know, in the sense that it wasn't in direct connection to the ego. It might be part of the background turnover, which is going on all the time. Neuroscience knows this. You know, the, the vast majority of our memory and our learning, our associations, it's all unconscious, doesn't perturb the ego, does not therefore then cause or feed into any neurotic condition. But once it, as Jung would have said, it reaches a certain energy level and energy quotients then it disturbs consciousness so basically that's how the the uh, unaligned complexes will work they'll just do their own thing no awareness by the ego we don't even know they're there it's well gone freud would say it's repressed and then maybe it comes back into our conscious association and then we make a decision do i want to identify with this or keep it away at a distance and i can deal with it a strong ego will say, no identification, I will deal with it. So it mm -hmm. keeps us in the aligned state. It's aligned because it's conscious. Aligned means there's a relationship, albeit of distance. Identified with means it's absorbed and included within the wider self-concept. The student then asks, in a clinical situation, if there was a complex presenting which was repressing a past instinctual frustration, how would you deal with this? I imagine you could indirectly take a permissive approach to the unconscious to allow it to return to homeostasis on its own time or go with engagement through the self-concept and conscious engagement with instinct. I can give you an empirical uh, response if that's okay because it, that, it's the closest thing to practical without as having an actual example to work with a, with a real person. You know? um, <laughs> yeah. 
what, what, what we find with complexes are that the bonds between them vary. It's not like an electron uh, or, you know, different energy shells in that sense. The, 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 the bonds are dynamic. So you'll get uh, elements which are aligned, identified with and unaligned potentially in something you could say is one complex. It's just that the aligned component is not within the self-concept. The identified component of this one complex is in the self-concept and there's one or more other aspects which can be potentially triggered depending on where the energy and the associative uh, processes and dynamics are going that could be non-aligned but in effect it's one system composed of more than one complex and they'll be in different states with different strengths of bond that can be broken sometimes and they'll be turning over quite naturally. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is that, that um, complexes will shed information. It's almost Darwinian. It, it'll be like, this is no longer serving my purpose. I'll shed that and I'll, that, that's interesting. I'll have a bit of that. So there's a lot of dynamic turnover going on all the time. Mm -hmm. So a complex fundamentally, when we say that it, it may start when the ego divides and then partitions itself through that division into devolving responsibility to another part of which which goes off and does its own thing that when that autonomous element is active it actually has its own homeostasis because it's set up to be homeostatic it is set up to self-regulate within its own bandwidth and tolerances the whole organism is is capable of doing that but the ego has given to it the capacity to learn and to be bipolar, to split, because there are some adaptive advantages in, in doing that. Uh, and I, I'm sorry again if this is technical, but if you don't mind, I'll run through it. The way the neuropsychoanalysts look at it, which I think is a, is a really useful way of, of conceiving it, is that the ego is very small in terms of its consciousness and its bandwidth, but it has a lot of experiences. So its job effectively is to become unconscious. This is the way Mark Solms talks about it. It wants to process experience so it doesn't have to think about it. It wants to keep its sensory modalities aware, open, tuned for survival and adaptation in the world. So that means it is bipolar. It's looking, this, this is good, that's bad, high, low, inside, outside, whatever it is, hot, cold. So it's doing that all the time, but it's limited. So it's got to shove things away from itself. If it gets overwhelmed with something which is very significant with respect to its survival or its status, its status, and that equals survival sometimes, if we have low status, we, we don't do well, then it might divide and say, you look after that, I don't want to think about it, but don't make it flattened out into memory. I want access to that at some point, and I can go back into that experience, access it quickly, and deal with it the next time it happens. So it's a kind of extended working memory. The problem is, though, the ego has the capacity to forget what it's done because it's shoving things out. And that means that the adaptability provided for by its capacity to split into partition autonomous elements means that a lot of them start to do their own thing. The student then says, almost as a means on the affective level of trying to get the attention of the ego to return and tidy it up. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That works. We know that that works. And uh, uh, even Mark Holmes talks about things being automatized into chunks, which are then automatic. Now, I would say that they are basically complexes of, of organized systems of, of reaction and response to the environment that we don't have to think about. They're triggered automatically. They've basically been processed that way. So the ego doesn't have to think about it. But some of them retain that ego. It's like a splinter psyche element and they don't get flattened out. They're not completely repressed. They, they are in effect psychodynamically, but not neurologically. And there's a, there's a distinction. Um, a neurological flattening out means that they are gone. A psychodynamic repression means it's still able to do its own thing. And this is what Freud and Breuer and then Adler and Jung all picked up on was those bits that had not been efficiently processed through memory. And that they're, they're wandering around with their own capacity to self-regulate because the ego self-regulates, everything self-regulates. And then the, they then start to look after their own interests. And basically the, the script is the conditions that set me up 
this would be the complex's internal instruction. The conditions that, that set me up to operate is my raison d'etre. This is why I exist. Why was I set up? To stop the ego thinking about something that's unpleasant. Okay, I'll do that. How do I do that? I make sure it doesn't know I'm here, but I'll operate. Okay, how do I, how do, I do that? I, I misdirect libido so it doesn't feel instinctive pressure to contradict me. I've been set up to protect him from these emotions. So when the emotion comes up, I'll have it. I'll take that. I'll use that as fuel. I, it will self-sustain. Well, how do I guarantee as, my com as a complex uh, my long-term survival? Well, I'll remain as unconscious as possible. Uh, and I'll make sure that if the ego tries to contradict what I'm set up for, I'll borrow some of the libido and turn it against the energy and uh, the ego. And I'll deflect that as an unpleasant emotion. So the ego will feel anxiety if it tries to contradict me. And that results in what we see in psychodynamic, first of all, suppression, which is the first stage of uh, an, uh, a complex's autonomy. It's, it's pushed away. The ego knows it's doing it. It's suppressed. And then later, it's effectively and affectively repressed with respect to the ego, and it has true autonomy. It's doing its own thing. But it looks two ways, the complex. It looks towards the ego, and it borrows the information that's coming in from the environment. It monitors what the ego's doing with that. And then it looks behind it, what's the instincts in the genome doing? And if the pressure comes up to individuate, for example, the complex might say, no, thank you, I'll cap that. Because if he individuates, I'm no longer required. Uh, I know this is a very metaphorical way of describing it, but functionally, that's what you meet. It's as if that is happening. So the inference must be, it is happening, effectively in that way and if we treat it as if that's happening then we will get a result we can make a prediction so we say okay there's a model how do we solve this problem and then we find because of that approach it's worked therefore we've more or less confirmed that the model is accurate so that's the empirical way of doing it uh, and that's pretty much the summation of our observations of how these things can work in the clinical uh, setting Yes, you use hypnosis. And of course, why do, do we do that? Well, because it's a dissociative mm -hmm. method. It, it utilizes the capacity that the ego has to divide. So we help it to divide. And when it's in that state, we can access other things that are divided. We're in that, well, the Tibetans would call it a bardo state, the interval, the gap. We're in the space where they operate. And then we can start to create a counter complex, for example, or we can access that complex and then hook it into the larger scale homeostasis that would want to correct for those complexes. And the way we do that is to access affect, but not as a quality of experience, but as a signal away from the emotion and the signal and into the instinct where we're in a very different world. Those instincts are massive, they're huge, their bandwidth is gigantic, it's a whole ecology, each instinct is an ecology of potential. And when we're in, in that territory, we're in the world that Jungians interpret, interpret as being archetypes, but we don't reify it as an archetype, because that then becomes another block to understanding the natural instinct and what that instinct is. So once we're in that territory, we can start to generate with the assistance of instincts and the genome itself, counter complexes, which will resolve it, working back up towards the ego and adaptation in the world. So that's why we use hypnosis, because it's a natural healing state of dissociation within which we can access complexes more easily and bypass them without reifying them. I hope I've uh, helped to explain a bit more nuance. It'll take time to, to filter, but the way to do that with any of this, which can seem to be too much information sometimes is to realize of course that it's actually very simple because everything is based upon real observation of real people uh the, de the describing of how simple it is makes it complex yeah. pardon the pun um and it isn't it's actually very simple and you'll feel that it's simple mm -hmm. because you'll feel your own resonance with that other person it's a relational dynamic and it's only afterwards that you need perhaps to think about it. And then the laborious sometimes task of explaining what you've done, because what you've done is natural and is outside or beyond of an intellectual description of it. So it makes that kind of theoretical uh, description a difficult thing to do.
but you'll know when you're doing it that it's right because it does feel right and it gets a result. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue your study of psychosystems analysis, then check the description for links to further resources, including our Discord server, our suite of educational handbooks, and our application page for professional training under Steve and Pauline Richards, leading to accreditation as a hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.